Okay, we are going to prepare the motion on proposition. This house believes that a global catastrophic risk will occur by the end of the 21st century. So in 80 years, there will be an event, which as the lecture tells us, will end humanity. Uh, and we have to argue why that is likely or indeed almost certain to happen over the next 20 years, uh, the next 80 years. So let's go through how we think we approach this debate and what we get from the videos and from the lectures, which could help us build that case in a more persuasive manner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can start, I think we can start from the, like, again, reiterating the definition, what does that mean in the sense of the debate? So global catastrophic risks uh, and the difference that some people when approaching the motion might, might have towards it. And like, it's, it's very important, especially if you, if you look at it from a perspective of a lecture, at least, uh, that it is a uh, no person, no no human uh, existing on, on planet Earth afterwards, which kind of changes the thing from like catastrophes, like possibly global warming can have a very catastrophic, uh, can have a very catastrophic consequences, but not necessarily fulfilling the burden of the motion, which is to prove that no human will exist because of a certain event, right? Yeah, I think that's an important point because at least what we get from the lecture is that global warming is not a global catastrophic risk and that it will not eliminate, it, it's not an existential risk and that it will eliminate all of humanity. It can be very bad, but I think our burden is probably greater than that. It is a question whether the op will push us in that direction, but assuming they know what we know, yeah. they probably would. And at which point we, yeah. there's a question whether proactively we want to deal with that. And part of my view is, at least in a BP debate, we probably do, if for no other reason than it also limits the bottom half. Yeah, so we can then split some somehow into, like obviously we would cover some of these like natural, natural occurring events and stuff, but like we should probably break it down into some segments uh, that we can talk about. Like basically we can break it down, in my view, probably in technological dangers, probably with a lot of focus on AI dangers, which would be the large part part of like, for example, an argument one. And then in argument two, we can do stuff like uh, nuclear, nuclear disaster weapons, uh, like biological weapons and other stuff. And like third, our third argument uh, can then deal with some like, more implausible scenarios, but there's scenarios that are still there, right? Like, like, uh, like as we said, uh, um, global warming, that's how so, I would structure, structure the, the next thing, yeah. My intuition is to structure it a little bit differently, which is we start with what exactly the risks are, which are going from AI or to technology all the way down. But I think the second argument, which either will be made in the first speech or in the second speech will be why humanity and the structures which exist are inadequate to mitigate these risks. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get that in the mm -hmm. lecture from why markets, which are gonna be the predominant way in which lots of these risks manifest, but also the way in which you would hope to deal with the risks is inadequate and why governments mm -hmm. are inadequate. So we have to rely on something else. And the reality is there's nothing else really to rely on. Yeah, that, that can actually be a good structure. I, yeah, okay. So, so let's let's talk about the first point then, like like about AI. How do we how do we structure it and not sound cra crazy? <laughs> that right. is, um, so, yeah, so I so, think we just need to start yeah. with a definitional claim, which is mm -hmm. to be accurate and potentially again to limit what we get from the bottom half. It is mm -hmm. that there are natural events. Um, asteroids is the most obvious example, which could lead to the end of humanity. That is plausible over the next 80 years, albeit not mm -hmm. inevitable. Our claim yeah, is yeah. instead that there are structural reasons why technology is gonna create a huge risk to us. And artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and in particular, uh, general artificial intelligence, so artificial intelligence, which has the same 
cognitive capability or greater cognitive capabilities as a human being yeah. is likely to exist and that creates a risk. My assumption is the idea that it's likely to exist probably doesn't need that much explanation beyond this mm -hmm. seems to be where technology is going. People are developing deeper and deeper neural networks. There is a belief mm -hmm. amongst the scientific community it will exist somewhere between the next 10 and 30 years that that bit is probably true. And the second part of that is mm -hmm. why is that a risk is where I think we need to build more of the analysis. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Like we, we do need to, we do need to talk about the first part that I will be focusing on is this like scientific overview uh, about like why and for which reasons, for which reasons we believe it's uh, it's likely that that the AI AI is happening. So, so what what are these reasons? Like other than like scientists says so, uh, scientists says so. We can we can give market like the demand for for a lot of these technology to exist. What other mechanisms can we give there? Like if we were to structure the argument at the moment. So I think it's just partially- Government being bad, yeah. I think That's... it's partially an intuition pump, right? That technology improves very yeah. rapidly over time. Mm -hmm. We're very happy with the idea of Moore's law. And, there, and I think the rest of it is just, there is demand for that to improve, both from yeah. the market. And I think the arguments there are fairly obvious that artificial general intelligence has a huge um, economic value in that you could do so much more than you can do yeah. in the status quo, that you could effectively use an algorithm to do what laborers currently do, so you don't have people pay people money. There's yeah. huge demand for it uh, from the market itself, but also from governments that having a mm -hmm. incredibly powerful AI system which could break codes, for instance, that could uh, deal with all the processing necessities that a complex government needs to run into also exist. So every factor pushes us towards this outcome that artificial okay. general intelligence is inevitable. So then yeah. what are the risks is attached this, to it? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so OP has basically two, two strategies that they can attack us on this, right? The one, one is basically that it's unlikely to be so powerful. Uh, which is again something that we're not fully addressing, but I'm not sure how we would fully address it, which is that, yeah, sure, there will be a demand. For example, I, I can envision opposition uh, conceding all of the mechanisms and saying, yeah, for sure, there will be a demand, but it will not be as powerful because there are some barriers that technology is having that are like insurmountable or they're very going to be very slow to, very slow to be tackled, like, like uh, how do you say, how AI is... Uh, processing the the tasks how ai is 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 uh, like making the correct decision or not uh, it, it, these things are are likely to be complete like i'm talking even though i don't know enough about it only from from the lecture to some extent i think some of these attacks are are easy to be made and easy to possibly like these counter arguments i don't know how what do you think can should we invest more time into talking about uh, why technology itself and these insurmountable like barriers are likely to be overcome, or do you think we can just count on judge so also not think, knowing? <laughs> I think there is an intuition pump, which is what did technology look like 80 years ago? Okay. And so when we're now back to 1940. <laughs> and in 1940, computers yeah. were hot, weren't even a thing. The idea of the internet, which uh, flattened the earth, didn't exist mm -hmm. at all. 80 okay. years from now, with more resources devoted than ever before to technology and technological prog progress, yeah. the idea that they think there is some limitation on what <laughs> we can do, I think is absurd and does not understand the reality of where we are now or where yeah. we're going to in the future. And even though I'm not sure we can I like that robustly, if an opposition really knows what they're talking about, I think both on an intuitive and rhetorical level, we can get pretty far with it. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, okay. Then, then we tackle this. So then let's talk about the risks, right? Like we can talk about, like obviously the first thing that comes to mind uh, when people develop these arguments uh, is basically Skynet, right? But like what we hear from the lecture and stuff is not necessarily, it's mostly to do with like human supremacy and like errors and like what, what can happen through there. What, what would you focus on? Like, what do you think we should... Uh, well, like, like, so, like it, to me, Skynet scenario or something like, 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 like them technological superiority, and then like this and the humanity just seems that nobody will be willing to buy that, right? Uh, so we have to ground it in some. Yeah, so I think that's a thing we say, but it's almost just a. It's something which comes up, I think, probably more in second as to the chances AI will control us all, uh, destroy us in multiple different ways, which aren't entirely controlled by human beings. I think yeah. the more plausible characterization is that we live in a world where I think the structural factor isn't just technology, it is also globalization. And I think COVID-19 is probably a good example here. We hear in the lecture that that's not an existential risk, which I think is true. But the important point is what is starts as a single country or single case problem can expand to the rest mm -hmm. of the world very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's, mm -hmm. it's difficult to contain a mistake to a single area. And it is certain that as China, the United States, Russia, the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, all develop high levels of artificial intelligence, when that's done both on a governmental mm -hmm. level and a corporate level, that there are probably going to be cases where this is gonna be incredibly risky. And that can be very hard yeah. to contain. And I think that's probably where we start pushing it, just in terms of what the mm -hmm. spill off and spill over benefits and consequences of that are. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, like, but that's important to be hammered, especially because, like, intuitively, if somebody didn't, if, if you don't watch a lecture or, or if you just like look at it from perspective, people would say that like the nuclear weapons or something. This is more intuitive. And for example, if closing government was to come up and talk about that or something, let's say if we didn't cover it, I think to some extent, uh, for already from the get go, we should start comparing these scenarios and, and talking about why even though other scenarios seem scarier, this one seems like likelier uh, to some extent. I don't know, I don't know what you think. It's just because of this intuition barrier that I think exists when talking about AI, uh, AI threat, uh, just people don't understand it as well, right? Yeah, so I, I, think there, I think there are two approaches here. One is to build up the AI threat, which is just to note that we say, uh, Look, here is a problem which Elon Musk, which Bill Gates, which almost every person who's involved in the field notes is potentially mm -hmm. huge. That we could have artificial intelligence much smarter than human beings. And in the same way, I can convince my five-year-old nephew to do whatever I want him to do, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. could convince us that that is a very serious mm -hmm. risk and one which is mm -hmm. which we don't understand compared to nuclear weapons. We understand, if we yeah. want to say this, like, and arguably we can push in the second speech that nuclear weapons are another existential risk, fair enough. But if we don't want yeah. to do that, it is that even compared to nuclear weapons, which we understand the consequences of, this is a greater problem. Mm -hmm. Especially because it's like like something that we cannot really grasp or imagine whilst mm. you can, you can see the amount of, or, or like there, there's, I think there is more levels of attack that can come from the opposition on the nuclear weapons thing, for sure. Uh, then, then, then can come from, yeah. And it might be because of people not knowing enough and knowing more from the from the thing, but like nuclear weapons just seems more vulnerable. It, I, I think it might be potentially worthwhile jumping on top of that, even before oppositions, maybe framing your case in that way. But yeah, that, that, that 
yeah, that would probably be the strategy. Yeah, uh, and I think it's do, worth do we have, noting yeah, go. that the, the difficulty for the opposition here is that they can't be very constructive in that mm -hmm. it is impossible to say that there will not be a catastrophic event over the next 80 years. Yeah. All they can do is try and mitigate what we are claiming. Yeah. Because but it, to, yeah. to some extent you can like if if we switch sides which which is also something that we that we uh, should do in a sense if you look at it from flip side I, I think you can frame uh, the, the 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 case and the burden of government is higher in terms of that they need to prove with 100% certainty that that something will occur rather than mitigations just showing that that some of the humanity, like you can concede by the definition that we established in the beginning, right? You can concede even super huge, uh, horrible scenarios where like 90% of the humanity dies, right? And still win the debate because that then would not fit mm. under the definition of the opening government, which is to some extent, uh, like if we switch sides, uh, it seems like it's potentially easier, right? Because like there's so many levels where you can concede the government and just say, yeah, but humanity will not be extinct extinct because of this. And this is what I see when when we were developing the AI, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when, we, when we were developing the AI argument, this is what I see as the main attack. Like like I would obviously try what can be very uh, un un uncomfortable when all opposition is approaching this, like, like for governments, is that I can from op construct three or four layers of attacks. One, it will not happen. Two, uh, when it happens, it's not gonna be a big deal. And three, even if it's gonna be a big deal, it's not gonna end to, uh, go to end of humanity. And to some extent from Gov, you need to defeat all three, right? Uh, yes. I, I don't know if, if you agree. Yeah. Right. That's how I would approach the opposition at least. My only difference would be the way I would prioritize this, <laughs> which is I think you start mm -hmm. with, here is the burden on the government. It is not that mm -hmm. there could be an event in the next 80 years which destroys 50% of humanity. This is not about COVID-19, which leads to a couple million deaths. This is about the destruction of humanity overall because that is what mm -hmm. we mean by a global catastrophic risk, which is total catastrophe um, and an existential problem. And I think that is just almost a definitional claim. And then the reasons why AI doesn't meet that it, are, are probably quite straightforward. It's worth even rhetorically, yeah. semi-rhetorically noting that Skynet is it a does it lead to the death of all of humanity? Indeed, that yeah. is the point of the entire the films that some of them still exist yeah, yeah. in order to fight, which is it seems to be deeper than that. They have to claim that it would eliminate all of humanity of the next 80 years. And I'm not sure how they yeah. can claim that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I was to approach like from the flip side as well. Um, like I think if, if like majority of people and majority of teams, if I was prepping for this in a real competition, uh, would go for the global warming. Like that would be the main point of this. So like even for the opening opposition, even if opening government doesn't talk about it, I think it would be a very important point to to to. Like I mean, it would be easy, especially from the things that you hear from the from the lecture about like. Uh, global warming having uh, like very very large negative consequences but not necessarily leading to a full-on extinction and like there is a possibility of leading to a full-on extinction but it's very like a very low percentage so i i think preempting some of these even things that initially you i would not personally run from government is also quite an important part of the op case i don't know yeah, uh, if you agree, I, just to not be blindsided by oh, CG or something. Absolutely worth mentioning. I think the way to mention it is when we start, which is, look, this is what a global catastrophic risk is, mm -hmm. to include within that why global warming climate change is not a global catastrophic risk, and that it creates huge harms, but under almost mm -hmm. every reasonable scenario, does not lead to the elimination of humanity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I but think uh, as the, I said, like, uh, yeah, yeah. Go I on. think the only other thing we would like to do on up um, is try and come up with reasons as to why there are so many mitigants in place. So some of those are just that the gut has a large burden. 
The other one is mm -hmm. that the world as it is now would reduce the risk of a catastrophic risk. And I think part of that is that there is going to be a large degree of regulation here. Every government has a bureau which is dealing and talking about artificial yeah. intelligence. Everyone yeah, is yeah. looking at climate change and saying, let's be carbon neutral by 2050. That doesn't solve the problem, but it nonetheless prevents a global catastrophic problem. And I think, oh, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. You can talk about the incremental, like even for AI, like it, it is fast, but to some extent it has to be incremental. So at some place you can claim why it is likely that it will be stopped, destroyed or mitigated or, or whatever. Right. So, yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's fair. So we don't have that much more time. Uh, do we have something else that we, that we, that we are yet to cover? Like we have a lot, but. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the rest of it is just largely working out how we structure it, which is I think on opposition, yeah. it will be here are the, this is what you need to prove to prove a global catastrophic risk, climate implicitly within that climate change does not meet that. And mm -hmm. this has not been proven by the other side. The other part of it is yeah. going to be here are the mitigants we have as to why that will not occur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, again, for government, just going from 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 the not necessarily the flashiest one, but from the one which is least likely to be attacked. And usually, as I said, like I think the best strategy in government is to play on this unknown factor. Uh, because like a lot of the stuff that uh, opposition can answer will be from the current examples and current technology. And I think the largest strength of the government can lie in this unpredictability and to some extent fear mongering, like, like mm -hmm. we don't know how this can look like and how, how. so hence the, the risk is too huge, hence uh, yeah. it can happen. And I think it's just from but the yeah. okay. clarity perspective that lack of knowledge is not the same as supporting the government. The yeah. government needs to push yeah. certainty as to the outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for sure. But uh, it would be hard. This house believes that we should fear nuclear threats more than biological ones. Okay. Let's right. define a nuclear so threat, right? <laughs> Well, so I think the first step, though, is what is the criterion we are using for what we should fear more? Because I think that's the first part of the debate. And then whether using our criterion, assuming we can defend it, nuclear threats are greater than biological yeah. ones. With sure, the sure. We, we can start. Running... Yeah. Yeah. We can start from the, sorry, sorry, just finish the sentence. I think we have a lot. Yeah, I mean, the additional problem is we're running slightly against intuition because the brand, because most people go, we, our lives have been turned upside down by a pandemic. So yeah. there is clearly a real biological, there are biological-esque threats out there, uh, albeit not quite the ones captured in the motion. So I sure, think sure, sure, sure. So, so there is a, there is a, like we, we need to, we do need to establish the criteria. So one, I think the one criteria is the risk, which one is more risky and likelier to happen. And second one is impact. Which I, I think to some extent you can make the impact at least somewhat symmetrical because like if you have a like nuclear war or something, it, it would be pretty much as deadly or potentially as deadly as, as like biological weapon uh, being released or, or uh, some virus being created, but like maybe not. But, but like I think that that's, that's the aspect where I think the, there is likelihood or likeliest of uh, it not being a wash, but being more washy than, than the risk part, right? One, one claim which we get from the start of the lecture is that there is a difference between a, an event which leads to death of 99% of humanity and 100% of humanity, in that the latter is considerably worse than the former, with the argument being mm -hmm. that means that there will be no humans and therefore no 
positive human experiences for however many years humanity would otherwise exist. I'm not sure if that observation is particularly powerful here, because I'm not sure whether biological or nuclear threats end up being more likely, but I do think it's probably worth us just mentioning that to begin with. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. I, I think th the only interaction there is that you can claim from the op is that even though maybe biological weapon or something like this is less likely or uh, to that scale, the potential to to completely wipe out humanity is larger than nuclear weapons. Yeah. I think that that's that would be non controversial thing to 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 claim. Okay. But yeah, okay, okay. Let's so, so we divided the criteria, right? Like like, do you agree the criteria should be probably like risk? plus the, the, the impact to some extent, yeah. right? Like, I don't know, do, do you think there is some other criteria to, to, to explore? Nothing which jumps to mind. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, so let's talk about like the, the nuclear. And, so, so, so who are the, we can talk about actors who are potentially to, who are, who have the potential to, to, to blow us up and to, to blow us all to hell. So, well, I th if, yeah, if we think we'll about the way this progresses through the debate, that we'll come up with actors and they'll say mutually assured destruction. Mm -hmm. And nuclear okay. weapons compared to biological weapons are probably more identifiably from a certain state, which seems to stand to sense because yeah. you need a large state apparatus, missiles, <coughs> mission technology, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get nuclear weapons. So we need to deal with mutually assured destruction when we look at yeah. the areas where we think there could be a risk. Yeah, yeah but, but to, to some extent, do you agree that there is a large overlap between the large countries that can produce like a very dangerous biological weapons and uh, also have nuclear weapons. I don't think there there will be a small country that can produce something very deadly biological wise, but they don't have a nuclear weapon currently, right? So so this debate, in my opinion, would still focus on the, the largest superpowers still, right? Potentially, though potentially when we talk about up, we talk about this further. I suspect that creating a biological weapon is difficult, but probably is less resource intensive than creating a nuclear weapon. If for no other reason than I think what we justify what we need to do to create a nuclear weapon is you need to have a nuclear material, you need to have a missile, so a deployment capacity, and then an explosive capacity, mm -hmm. which involves a yeah. lot more than okay. creating something in a lab, which arguably could be done more easily. But we could go either way with that. But I think that's where I would go if okay. I just try to respond to it. Okay, so, so, so from government side, we are defending that nuclear weapons are, nuclear catastrophe is more dangerous, right? Yeah. This is the this is the thing that, that we are responding. So to some extent, like we have two two aspects, right? We have to diminish the the risk of somebody creating something very deadly and well, like that actually going out, uh, which is also which which is also something that, something that I would possibly even start with. Uh, like as you said, as you said at the beginning, right? Uh, uh, yeah, you need the, you need this huge capacity to create nuclear weapon for sure. But like I would also say, if you want to create a very deadly biological weapon that is not like just shit virus or something like this uh, you would also need to have a, like a large capacity or something you can claim that it can happen by accident that like super virus mutates or something like this but to some extent i i, I think from government side you can claim that this is very implausible and like if you want to create something that is um uh, uh, that is very deadly uh, by by the metric of the motion like has a lot of impact you would need to have like a lot of tinkering a lot of things mm. yeah what, what, yeah and so i think so, so th true. there is also one more thing there is also there is also one more thing right to 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 claim right so when you're constructing biological weapons right like you you also know that it can backfire on you which is to some extent not necessarily true about the nuclear nuclear weapons right so to some extent you need to simultaneously be developing the ways of treatment. Like I, I don't think any of the large yeah. countries are stupid enough not to 
make some sort of a backup. And obviously it can go out of control, but I think that decreases the risk given what I just said, that uh, it, it like spirals out of control, runs out of the lab, somebody releases it and it goes wild without anybody knowing anything about the virus, right? Itself. So I think systematically what we're saying is as follows, which is very serious nuclear risks exist, both in the forms of weapons and in Chernobyl's case, uh, in the form mm -hmm. of nuclear power and poor quality of control over it. The reason why that is serious is on the nuclear power level that there are <laughs> lots of countries which want to invest in nuclear power or we can't ensure safety standards, CF Chernobyl. Um, and I think we could try and make that out to be a non, it's not just that it was 30 years ago, it was also that this is about underdeveloped countries looking to move away from fossil fuels. Um, but I think once we have done that, it is that also nuclear weapons are a risk because mutually assured destruction does not work. It does not work, mm -hmm. one, because there is probably a subset of cases where you believe that mutually assured destruction is a good deal, i.e. the destruction of another country or an enemy is worth doing even if you destroy your own major capital cities. Two, with second mm -hmm. strike capability, even if you believe in mutually assured destruction, you will be less destroyed than the other if you attack mm -hmm. first. And this is why you have early yeah. warning systems or first strike capabilities. Are there any other reasons why we think yeah. nuclear disaster becomes plausible or becomes likely? Yeah, but potential technological advancements means that mutual assured destruction might not uh, stay mutual, right? Mm. So, which means that if you if you develop like a superior uh, anti missiles, anti missiles or something, early warning systems or something like this, it might not be as mutual. Which means that you might be more willing to go into something like this. But th there are responses to this, obviously. But like, right. I would I would possibly try. And I, I think the final part of that, which I think you you highlight there is that we don't need to be talking about state actors, that a nuclear threat could be from a non-state actor as well. Mm -hmm. They just need nuclear material, strap in improvised explosive device, the kinds which you see in Afghanistan and yeah. Iraq every single day. And that could create yeah. a very real damage to a and, major and area. Can, can we also claim, I, I think we I think we can also claim that like with the development of other types of technology, better manufacturing, faster manufacturing and like AI to some extent even, it will be easier like uh, in the future years to faster make nuclear weapon or for maybe even weaker actors to make it uh, faster and like then uh, having a lot of trouble. So, so, so uh, that, that's another, th other thing that I would possibly claim, right? That you can see how, how much Iran has been, how, how much Iran has been avoiding uh, uh, the sanctions and all of this stuff and developing it potentially, or, or North Korea might be even a better example to some extent, right? Uh, yeah, so I guess the claim we can make is that nuclear weapons or nucle nuclear technology is much more accessible than biological technology both because mm -hmm. the non -nu the mm -hmm. nuclear the non nuclear proliferation treaty or nuclear Pro mpt allows us to to allow the expansion of civilian nuclear technology which is also a risk mm -hmm. but it is also that just looking at the example so north korea being the example you've given uh, even states which are in most ways underdeveloped can still develop fairly strong nuclear technology now my only mm -hmm. question there is, why is that different than biological? So, so here's the, here is like, like some of the things I already said, right? Like, like first, firstly, I think uh, the risk of creating, uh, there is a deterrence uh, of the host uh, who's, uh, who, who is supposed to make biological weapons, right? To some extent, the, the potential risk that back that backfiring onto your population is much higher than a nuclear weapon. Like like nuclear weapon manufacturing that explodes, fine. But uh, deadly virus uh, escaping and killing your population means that a lot of the people uh, are either, I think, lim limiting the capacity of, upon which they're doing this or 
they're not doing it at all. Secondly, there is a lot of inter like obviously there's still secret operations and secret missions, but there are international treaties that are prohibiting this. So you cannot really do this openly. Uh, so so uh, I think that excludes a lot of the smaller countries from the mix, mix right? Because like they would be mm -hmm. figured out immediately and then fucked over by the international community. So it includes only the largest players. And even with these largest players, I'm not sure that's the pr most productive time and resource management, right? Like, especially with the, with the potential to, to fuck you over uh, in a while. Uh, I don't know, yeah. maybe COVID. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's probably yeah. the final part of it, which is a nuclear, a nuclear weapons at Hiroshima destroyed an entire city. As bad as COVID mm -hmm. was in Wuhan, in London, in New York City, these cities are still going to function that on an impact level, mm -hmm. the destruction of hundreds of thousands of lives, the entire infrastructure of the city, the livability of the city in future because of yeah. the nuclear radiation <laughs> is different than a, a biological threat where plausibly in the next five to 10 years, um, probably an extreme, you would find vaccines to be able to allow people to live with them. And I think that's probably yeah. the final part There's, of the problem. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and as I said, like, again, uh, it might be morbid to compare it like this, right? But like, if you throw a nuclear weapon on somebody and destroys their country, that's done, it's over. It's a one-off thing, right? Releasing a pandemic level virus onto somebody else is just like a recipe for fucking yourself over. Like, like obviously you're gonna fuck, fuck over the another country, right? And, and, and the, that country is gonna be in ruins. But like the virus is not going to stay contained in that country, most likely if you made it very to be very effective, right? So in that sense, yeah. like I, I'm not sure it's even a good, uh, good weapon to use in any kind of warfare. So the only scenario is like potential accident, and if the only scenario where you would where you would actually use this is uh, by accident, I'm not sure why you would uh, divert a lot of resources into uh, into these biological weapons and stuff. So I don't know. Yeah. I think that's probably a okay. useful final well, point to make. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if we're on the opposition, okay. what, would, what would we be doing? So I think there are two. So I think it's more or less symmetric than what we talked about on the proposition, which is what exactly is the impact and what is the likelihood? I think let's deal with the likelihood mm -hmm. first. And I think the obvious part about likelihood is mutually assured destruction that the only case mm -hmm. where nuclear weapons have been used was a case where one country had a monopoly over the use of nuclear weapons. This is yeah. not the case today. And any case where we could imagine them potentially being used is one where either the other state has weapons or is close allied with someone who does. And even to the degree mm -hmm. you aren't certain that an attack from, say, the United States on Iran will lead to a nuclear retaliation, you're probably not willing to risk the destruction of Washington, D.C. for the destruction yeah. of Tehran. So even in that scenario, the only case where it would seem plausible that you wouldn't use nuclear weapons would be tactical. It would be maybe just dealing with a bunker, a, a low yield nuclear weapon, which is just another weapon of war. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, 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 by, uh, so the motion says biological catastrophe, right? And all of these yeah. things. Um, how, how the, so we can, we can possibly reframe the debate from up more from uh, this being intentional biological weapons as much as accidental like from something completely completely different like you like can we make a claim uh, that a deadly virus can emerge from something other than uh, it being created to be a weapon mm. it seems plausible that it can right like maybe some trials maybe some playing around with the with the viruses trying to figure out a, a how they say remedy or for something else, and then uh, that mutating the virus or something else, right? Yeah. So because if we can expand that, uh, then then uh, th th it's easier for for up for us to win, right? 
Yeah, so I think part of it is what we've already said, right? Which is that, how exactly do we push this claim? Uh, I think, so, so I guess it's said twofold, which is one, that there is clearly reasons why states would develop biological weapons, which is this can be very mm -hmm. effective. Um, if you know how to target it correctly, you would do it. Even if states don't think it's going to be used in the end, you don't want to fall behind. The Americans don't want to fall behind the Chinese, so they still end up putting money in it. Look at history. Look at Svetlosk, um, Ekaterinburg, where you ended up with the development of biological weapons, which ex went out to the wild. There are lots of reasons why that could occur. I think that's part one. So second is, are there good reasons why other factors could lead to biological uh, to biological threats? I think we would just say, yeah, as you research more, as you try and work out what is more virile and what is more of a risk, there is a risk. Your, your lab technician is infected, he infects someone else, that infects mm -hmm. someone else. And all you have to do is look at COVID-19 to see the pandemic claim. And I actually think this is the important point, which is a nuclear war is broadly one country attacking another and the other one retaliating. Mm -hmm. A biological attack is one country attacking and now you have a pathogen which is very difficult to control, which could spread across the world very, very easily. And, and yeah. while I think it speaks to the propositions claim that maybe you won't use it, I think the response to that would just be, you still believe you can have some control over it. You can maybe have your own vaccine in your own country, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, as potentially a reason why the impact is as contained. But to some extent, what you can what you can claim is that we know more about nuclear energy and, and generally all of these things. We have mm -hmm. been developing it for a while. So we know a lot of potential risks, a lot of risks in regards to viruses and bacteria or stuff that we can release. We just don't know how to control. And we, like, just as I said, like, just look at COVID-19 and how people are struggling to understand the virus to begin with, right? So in a lot of the places where you're playing around with creating a biological weapons, uh, you are not really fully knowing what you're doing, which is the most dangerous part uh, of it. And th 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 that's how I would frame it, right? The most dangerous part comes from us trying to do something that we don't really know much about and then that spilling over leaking mutating and doing all of these bad stuff which again has like i would the second framing that i would do is that nuclear weapons have a like potential to be deadly for a targeted place and potentially like as i said like nuclear winter in the worst case scenario whilst global pandemic from a deadly virus is potentially like, uh, as we said, the catastrophic event that can lead to extinction of humanity and that can spread to every corner of the earth and affect every corner rather than some, being a local uh, damage or something, yeah. even though that's morbid, mor morbid comparison. <laughs> yeah, so all we're doing there is negating the idea of like a nuclear global winter, which seems yeah. to be fairly straightforward to negate in terms of how weapons would likely actually be used. Now we don't live in the Cold War world, but let's compare our biological weapons or, or biological okay. threats in general. Yeah, um, yeah, I feel fairly comfortable then with the op. Yeah, so um, anything else, any last remarks that we have or summing up? No further remarks. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks. Bye.